God bless you. While we are in this season of shut in and shut down, I thought it best that we come to you every afternoon at 12 o'clock. And we've got enough film in our archive so that we can bless you with one of the world's greatest preachers. I'm talking about my father, my predecessor, Bishop Tom E. Diamond, uh, by far the best preacher I know. And I've got a chance to now play him for a whole generation who might not have ever heard him preach before. My baby girl brought the suggestion. She said, Dad, I think folk who've never heard granddaddy would love to hear him. And so we figured it out. So every day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at 12 noon, you will be able to tune in and check out the best of Bishop Tommy Diamond uh, some of his best sermons and lectures, uh, just an hour. And I think, better yet, I know you will be blessed. So come now and join us for the best of Bishop Tommy Diamond. Our comforter, amen. We have a praying spirit that, that uh, comforts us amen uh actually that's 26 and 27 okay romans 8 26 and 27 so romans 8 15 26 27 and then i want to talk about from there that also the high priest the praying paracletus the high priest after the order of melchizedek and and our subject on the high priest is found in hebrews 4 14 amen hebrews 4 hebrews 4 14 okay and then the parent that pardons and provides and i'm talking about god the father the parent that pardons and provides second chronicles 7 14, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, amen. Okay, I've given you quite a bit to look at, but let's, let's talk first about, let's, let's see what the, the scriptures will teach us about the praying paracletus, the high priest, and the parent that pardons and provides, amen, amen. The first thing that we discover that we want to talk about really is the praying paracletus, the paracletus, the, the comforter, the one who strives along beside us to comfort us, to aid us, to teach us all truth, to lead us in, in all truths, amen? One who strives along beside us to comfort us, to aid us in all truths. Get us some water, yes, amen, okay? Now, so we have a praying paracletus. Let's read Romans 8, um, 8, 14, 15. What did I say? 8, 15. Let's read Romans 8, 15. And how does it read? You, you don't have to stand. You can be seated. Romans 8, 15 says what? What do you do when... All of a sudden, something tragic falls in your life, amen? Your child get, get, get sick unto death. You are confronted with a disease that the doctor can't cure, and they didn't know about it, and this thing is out of hand. What do you do when you're confronted with economic circumstances that threaten you to lose your house and, get, and threaten you with bankruptcy? What do you do? Do you panic? Because that's the first impulse that I have is to panic and that's just a human thing all right so so according to my 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 feelings amen according to my soul amen my first response to a tragedy or an impending uh, 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 trial is to fear to worry that that's my soul's reaction but what should be the reaction of my spirit my spirit should react with believing God. My spirit should react with 
getting in touch with God. My spirit should react with, I don't have to be afraid of what I'm confronted with because I have a spirit who prays for me and who enables me to cry, Abba, Father. Ah, there is no problem that you can have that God can't solve. Are you hearing me? Absolutely no problem that any of us can have that God can't solve. Whatever it is that you're confronted with, God can handle it because there's nothing too hard for God. Are you hearing me? Amen? And what, we, what, I, what I have to decide in my spirit is that I'm going to believe God more than I believe the, 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 the doom and the danger that confronts me. I'm going to have more confidence in God than I have in that that stands in opposition to my well-being or the well-being of my loved ones. Amen? And what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe God and his word? Or are you going to believe the circumstance that you've been suddenly confronted with? And, and read that scripture again. It says what? You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have what? There is the spirit of bondage that will ride on every tragedy, every trial, and every tribulation. There is that spirit of bondage that wants to bring us back into captivity and be, confront and be, con and, and be enslaved by all of the things that we can't handle. Amen. Amen. I'm always, it's always there with me. My soul is ready to accommodate this spirit of bondage, this spirit of fear. But there is another spirit. Amen. We have received the spirit of what? Transformation. The spirit of transformation. That spirit that transforms us from children of God into sons of God. That spirit that transforms us from children into full-grown, matured uh, adults in Christ. Are uh, you following me? When I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, I speak as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Amen? I was walking in my spirit when I was a child. I was being controlled by my, my, my soul. Amen? And I was afraid. I was in bondage to fear of everything that confronted me that threatened my well-being that I couldn't handle. I was in that state. But praise be to God, I met Jesus one day, and he saved my soul, and he gave me the gift of his Holy Spirit, and now I have another spirit that I can reference. I don't just have to reference my soul's fear, but my spirit can reference the Holy Spirit who resides in my spirit. I got, I got a spirit that enables me to go to the one who can solve every problem. Jesus said, have faith in God. All things are possible to him that believe. Amen. God is able. Will you help me say that? God is able. Will you help me say it again? Will you help me say God's word cannot fail? God's word cannot fail. God's word cannot lie. God's word is the truth. I trust God's word. More than I fear sickness. More than I feel economic bankruptcy. I trust the word of God, which says, My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. My, my, my. What a word. Come on, give God a big hand clap of praise. I got to watch it because I can go over time with this. Now, I don't want to go over time. But let's keep reading. Again, in, that's, that's, we have a high priest. We, we have, a, a, I'm going to say, a paracletus. We have a Holy Spirit whose job it is to turn our hearts toward God when we see something that we can't handle. Amen? Not toward fear, but toward the Father. Amen? That's what the Holy Spirit is in there. What he's there to tell you, listen, don't panic. God can handle it. Listen, don't let that bother you. God can handle it. Amen? The doctor say you're going to die. Don't let that bother you. God can handle it. The doctor is a practitioner. He's not, he's not a healer. He's a practitioner. Amen? You haven't heard the last word until you hear from God. Are you hearing me? 
and you can be healed of all your diseases. I don't care how young or how old you might be, you can be healed of all your diseases. You don't have to die from diseases. Amen? You can be carried home standing up, amen, w working and amen, walking and being busy and just go home to be with the Lord. You don't have to go home in a bed because you're 90 or 100 years old. You don't have to die from disease. That's not for you. When did Jesus have a disease? If Jesus didn't have a disease and he came here to show me what was available to you and I, I don't have to have diseases. Are you hearing me? I don't have to have them. And all I got to do is believe God's word more than I believe in the disease. <laughs> Let's read uh, again familiar scripture, Romans 8, uh, what did I say, 26 and 27. And what does it say? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth thy infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Amen? The Spirit. Now, some people use this scripture to say, I I'm praying in the Spirit. But when Paul talked about I pray in the Spirit in, in 1 Corinthians 14, he said, I pray in the Spirit. That's a small spirit. He ain't talking about capital spirit. He's talking about his spirit. Amen? This gift of tongues come from, is a gift of my spirit. So he says, I, some, I pray in my spirit, and then I pray with my understanding. Amen? In, my, in plain language. Are you following me? He's talking about his spirit. This is not a, a support scripture for that praying in his spirit. Amen. Are you following me? This is another scripture. This is a scripture that's in line with what he started talking about up there in 814. And he continues to this theme when he gets down here in 826 and 27. He says, I got a paracletus. I got a, a comforter. I got a Holy Ghost, which helps me to pray. pray amen. Because I don't know what I should pray for when I am confronted with infirmities. So I have a Holy Ghost who can pray for me. Praise be to God, I don't have to rely on my words or my expression or my ability to communicate to God. I got a Holy Ghost who will do it for me. I do the best that I can, and he'll do all that I can't do, and he will communicate to God the Father, amen, in a groaning, in a language that only he can utter, amen, we can't utter it, the devil can't understand it or utter it, only God can understand it. It's God talking to God, through God, for me. Praise his holy name. Do you hear what I'm saying? My, 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 my. That's, I don't, I'm not going to be able to get any further because I go over time. But listen here. I got a Holy Spirit. Amen. He's touched with the feelings of my infirmity. Amen. I got a Holy Spirit who, who prays for us. And read that second, that second line, now, that, next prayer, that ne next verse. It says what? All right, now hold it, hold it. He that searches the heart. When the Holy Ghost is born into your life, amen, he's born into your spirit. That's where he resides. He doesn't reside in my flesh, amen, my selfishness. He does not reside in my soul, amen. He resides in my spirit, amen. And that's where he communicates. The spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Amen? It's the spirit bearing witness with our spirit. So he lives in my spirit. He that searches the heart, the heart talking about the spirit. The, the center of my being is my spirit, not my soul, not my flesh, but my spirit is the center of my being. That's what heart means. He communicates, he searches my spirit. He that lives in my spirit searches my spirit and he knows what is what? Go ahead. Let's read it. He knows what is the mind of God. He searches my spirit. He knows what's on my heart, in my heart. He knows the need that I'm carrying in my heart. And he knows the mind of God. My, my, my. Amen. So he catches my need. And he, I'm doing the best I can when I say, Lord, help me. 
Lord, I'm sick and I need to be healed and I'm, I'm believing you for my healing. I'm doing the best that I can. But the Spirit catches that need and he starts communicating it to God in God's language. Are you hearing me? Praise his holy name. Now I got a spirit, a paracletus. I got a priest. I got a parent. All three of them are working so that my needs can be met and your needs can be met. Are you hearing what I'm saying? How can I go into my prayer closet and come out empty-handed when all of God Amen. is working just to meet my need? Amen. Praise his holy name. We'll talk about the rest of it because the high priest. Amen. We, we, have not a high priest who is not, we have not a high priest who has not been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But in every way that we have been tempted, so has he, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. I don't have to be timid. I know I messed up. I know I ain't no good. Praise his holy name. But it ain't on my goodness that I'm coming to him. I'm coming to him on the grace of Jesus Christ and the goodness of God the Father. Praise his holy name. So I don't have to be afraid to go into the throne room. They used to go behind the veil with fear and trembling. They tie a rope around the priest's leg lest he stay back there in the presence of God and be killed by the holiness of God. But I don't have to go into the throne room with fear and trembling. No, no, no. I can come boldly, praise his holy name, into the throne room of God boldly because I'm covered. Don't you know you're covered by the blood of Jesus? I can go boldly into, and it's a throne of grace. I got something for you that you don't deserve. You need a healing. I got it. You don't have to deserve it. He says, if, he said, confess your faults one to another. He said, confess your fault. Did you hear what he said? He said, not my faults. Confess your, don't get on the phone and talk about my fault. God knows your fault. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. And the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much with God. I don't have to come trembling. I can come saying, Lord, I'm just this dirty. Lord, I'm just this low down. Lord, I've done this to you. And I'm sorry, but I need you right now. I need you because I, I'm confronted with something that I can't handle. I need you right now, Lord. And I don't have to be afraid because it's a throne of grace and I can find mercy to help in the time of need. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee, oh, bless. You know it, you know it. Me now, my Savior, I come to, to, to thee. for a holy God, but I come to, to, to thee. Do you need him? 
Do you need him? Do you need him? Don't be ashamed to say, I need the all. I need the oh Lord. Have, come on, say it this morning. Real. I need thee, oh, bless, bless me now, bless me right now, right now, Lord, right now, bless me now, my Savior, Savior, that you will pray more and if you pray more you will get more because the Bible says you have not because you what ask not so we're trying to increase your confidence in praying and I know of no better way to increase and encourage your confidence in praying than to take the model prayer that Jesus taught us to pray and the disciples asked Jesus one day Lord teach us to pray he didn't ask Jesus Lord teach us how to pray Obviously, praying is a no-brainer. There are two types of prayers uh, in general that we offer to God. We offer one called the prayer of supplication, and that's, that's, that's deesis, and the prayer of faith, that's prosuki. Now, the prayer of supplication, we were praying that when we came here. In fact, when we were born, the doctor took us in his hand, held us upside down, racked us on our rump, and we prayed the prayer of supplication. <laughs> and we were praying. That's, that's, a, that's a crying is a prayer of supplication. And obviously, the baby was, we were trying to tell whoever did that, whoever in my environment that inflicted this pain, don't do that no more. I can't talk. I can't say some choice words to you right now. I haven't learned them yet. But I know this. <laughs> The Bible has more to say about God answering the cries of his children than it does the prayers of his children. Do you know that? Amen? So if you don't have faith operating and you still need to get a prayer through, amen, because you need God's help, you can give God your cries, the prayer of supplication, and he will hear your prayers. Isn't that good news? So he says in this part of the prayer, and this was kind of puzzling to me, that Jesus said when you pray, Tell God, say, Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. I, and, and, and so why would I have to ask God to lead us not into temptation? I was trying to figure that one out. So I, I went to James, and James says, let no man say that when he's tempted, that he's tempted of God, when he's tempted of sin, that he's tempted of God, because God cannot sin, neither can he tempt any man to sin. Amen? It is categorically out of God's ability to tempt somebody to sin. There's some things God can't do, even though he's all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere at the same time. There's some things that God can't do. One of those things is God can't lie because he's the truth. And God cannot tempt you to sin because sinning is against everything that God stands for and God is. Are you hearing me? So what did the Bible mean when Jesus, what did Christ mean when he said, pray, uh, Father, lead us not into temptation. I just knew that there were two different words for temptation, Caroline. I thought that there had to be two different words for temptation in the New Testament Bible. I thought that there had to be one word uh, in Greek for temptation, meaning tempting to sin. And another word uh, in, the, in the Greek text for temptation having to do with what I'm asking God not to do, not to lead me into temptation. But in doing the research, I found out not true. Just one word for temptation. And then Christ said, when you pray, ask the Father to lead you not into temptation. And so one word for temptation, and yet the Bible says, don't say when you are tempted to sin that you were tempted of God. God can't do that. 
So what is this temptation? I had to do some further research, and guess what I discovered? I discovered when the Bible talks about temptation, it's the one who's doing the temptation or who's leading you into the temptation. It, it, his motive determines his position in regards to why he's testing you. Because the word temptation means to test. And so when God tests us, he's not testing us to make us fail or to sin because God can't do that. So obviously there's a different reason that God tests us from the, the reason that the devil tests us. Are you following me? Because when the devil tests us, he's testing us to get us to sin, to fall, to fail, amen, to end up in destruction. So here we go. Jesus, after he uh, was baptized by John in the River Jordan, and he straightway coming up out of the water, the heavens open up, God the Spirit in the form of a dove descended and lit on his shoulder, and God the Father thundered from beyond the sky and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And here was Jesus at his finest hour on planet Earth. Jesus was at the zenith of his glory on planet Earth coming up out of that baptism and having all of heaven to bestow on him all of the honor that can be bestowed on him. God the Spirit descending like a dove and certifying him as the Messiah, the anointed King of King and Lord of Lords and God the Father who thunders from beyond the clouds and say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He looks just like his daddy. And in his finest hour, in his greatest earthly glory, the Holy Ghost grabs him, as it were, by, by the back of his collar and the seat of his pants and takes him and thrusts him, throw him out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You got to be careful because God will test us he will either test us before he blesses us. He will test us after he blesses us. So you got to be careful that when you get blessed with that house that you need and that person that you've been praying for, I hope that's the person. When you get blessed with all of what you've been praying for, that you don't get so high and minded with your chest all swollen up and forget about where your blessings come from. Because it's re you're real subject to fail when you get everything you want. Oh, when you are in need, it's God to have mercy, Lord, and God can't turn for us when we're in need. But when we get everything I, we want, then God be looking for us and say, where's that boy? I, where's that child? I haven't seen her since I blessed her. So you got to watch testing because God will test you before you are blessed, while you are being blessed, and after you are blessed. And here Jesus is, after he was blessed, then God decided that I'm going to give him one of his greatest tests. Threw him out in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now God's motive for putting Jesus in the wilderness was not to tempt him to sin. He was not testing Jesus to sin. God was testing Jesus to prove to Jesus that he was faithful to all that he had promised him that he would do for him, through him, and with him. Amen? That's why God was putting him out there. And God was getting ready to take Jesus to the next level of his assignment. And God said, I got to test you, amen, so that you would know that you are ready to go to the next level. Do you know that God tests us? Not, not because he's going to discover something about us or learn something about us. Do you realize that God tests us some, uh, uh, all the time to teach us something about ourselves that we, are, we don't know or that we are ignoring? Did you know that? Because a lot of times I don't know how... I don't know how strong the veracity of my faith in Jesus Christ is until I go through a little test. Amen? And, and then during the test, when I should be strong and stalwart in my faith and trust in God, I go to running and crying and everything, and then sometimes God has to run me down and stop me and say, Where you going? Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. I'm going to take care of you. So God was not testing Jesus to make him sin. He was testing Jesus to prove his own faithfulness and the magnitude of his grace in the life of Jesus. He was testing Jesus because Jesus had to represent all of us. And, and, and God was testing him to show him 
that with God's help, he's able to do what God has assigned him to do. God is never testing us to make us fail. He's never testing us to make us sin. He's always testing us so that he can prove to us how strong he loves us and how great is his grace toward us in every situation. Are you hearing me? Thank you, God. Because you're not trying to make me fail. He doesn't want us to fail. Are you hearing me? Amen. Now, the devil was tempting Jesus for a different reason than what God was tempting him for. God threw him out there to be tempted of the devil so that God can prove his, his love and his help to Jesus. But the devil was testing Jesus to make him fail. The devil was testing Jesus to make him sin so that he couldn't represent us. But at every point that the devil tempted uh, tested Jesus. Jesus passed the test with flying colors. He only has three ways to test us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Those are the only three ways the devil has no more in his arsenal than those three things to test us. He can test us with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's what he tested Jesus with. He showed Jesus rocks that looked like whole cakes of bread, and Jesus had been hungry because he'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil said, look at those stones. Don't they look like bread? Well, you got the power. It was you who stepped out into nowhere and spoke into nothing and called words into being. You can speak to these stones and they would turn into bread and go eat. And Jesus said to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone. Bread alone only feeds the physical body, but there's more to me than a physical body. In fact, the most of me is that I'm a spirit, I own a soul, and I live in a body. But, but the real part of me that does not die and does not go out of existence is my spirit and soul. And so because I am a spirit and not a body with a soul and a spirit, but I'm a spirit with a soul and a body, now the bread that I need more than any other bread is the bread called the Word of God. And so man shall not live by bread alone, but you must live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Do not trivialize any word that you find in the Word of God. Every word. You must live by it. Are you hearing me? Christians, it's time for us to stop living like we were living when we were in sin. Too many of us are living like we've always lived before we met Jesus. Too many of us, I would dare say the overwhelming majority of us, are still living like we used to. We cut out some things. I don't smoke anymore. I don't drink like I used to. Good, good, good. Give you a hand clap of praise, amen? But look at that mess we're still doing. Did I say we? You got that right. And we need to take the word of God and let that word of God measure us. In everything we do, say, think, or feel, let the word of God measure us. I ain't trying to measure up to you or to you. Or you are human just like I am. You are subject to make mistakes. I don't be needing to use your life as no example. No, you're not my example. The life of Christ is my example. Christ is the bread of life. He is the word of God made flesh. That's the example that I need. I need to take the word of God and measure my life up against the word of God and all this junk that I'm doing that's outside and transgressing against the word of God, I need to stop it. And so do you. And then the devil came and he took Christ and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, look at all these kingdoms. Ha, 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 I own them. He's a liar from the beginning. He was the original liar. And if you would bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these kingdoms. Well, Christ had read the 23rd Psalms, <laughs> the 24th Psalm. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has established it upon the flood. He has founded it upon the sea. And so Christ looked at the devil and said, how are you going to offer me what's already mine? I created you, Lucifer. You, I own you. You can't offer me nothing. And then Christ said to the devil, he said, you shall worship the Lord our God, and only him shall you worship. Amen. And then he tempted him one more time, pride of life. Took him up on a high place, and he said, jump off. And don't worry about 
gravity, the law of gravity, when it pulls you down to the earth, rather than splattering on the rocks beneath, the angels as it is written. You know the devil know the Bible? And how many times do you read it? He know more about the word than you do because you don't read it. But he's read it through and through. And he said, it is written that the angels will stop you from dashing against the rocks. And Jesus said to the devil, he said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen? You shouldn't tempt God. Are you hearing me? Now listen. God told us, he said, bring ye all the tithe that there might be meat in my house and put me to the test right now here with this tithe. And see won't I open you up the windows of heaven and pour you out so many blessings you will not have room enough to receive them all. God said, put me to the test. Man, I never heard that before. I never heard God inviting us to put him to the test because any other time you shall not test the Lord thy God. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. But God himself said, I want you to put me to the test so that I can prove to you how much I love you and how much I am going to uphold my word and how faithful I am for what I promised. If I promised it, that does it. And some of us still haven't tied. Well, some of us tied one time. So I'm going to give you one shot. This is it, God. You got one shot to get this right. And we pay tithe one time. And then we say, see there? Nothing happened. I knew it wasn't going to happen. Negro, you woke up this morning. And, and, and you, you, you talking about nothing happened? Who you think woke you up? You think that alarm clock woke you up? When the alarm clock went off, how did you have the capacity to hear it? Who is it that gave you hearing power? Who is it that kept your heart beating even when you slipped down into that almost coma-like state? Who is it that woke you up this morning? Who is it that put food on your table and clothes on your back? Who is it that keep you alive? Who is it that's been taking care of you from your earliest existence up into this present day? It's been God! See, here's the fact is that God said, go ahead and put me to the test. Why, God? Because I'm already doing what I'm promising you that I'm going to do. Already doing it. Windows of heaven, more blessing than you can receive, already doing it. Uh, look at y'all, you're so blessed. You know you're blessed. You know, who told, did you, look, look, look how dressed up you are. If somebody told you you'd be living in the house you're living in and doing as well as you're doing and driving what you're driving, if they had told you that 30 years ago, you would have looked at them and said, oh, not me, no, no, my, I'm poor, poor, I'm real. I, I am not poor, I am poor. But look at where you are right now. Praise his holy name. And don't you know in this country, we, those of us who say that we are poor compared to the other nations, two-thirds of the world, we are very wealthy. The poor people in America is above the other people in two-thirds of the world's population. And you're talking about blessed beyond measure. We are a blessed people. Amen. So when you pray, say, lead us not into testing. Amen? Amen? And then I'll come back and talk about but deliver us from the evil one. That's the way that's really interpreted. But deliver us from the evil one. I don't mind you testing me, God, because you test me to bless me. You test me to show you, to show me how much you love me and how much grace you're going to give to me to get me through the test. But when the evil one tests me, he tests me to make me fail. He tests me to draw me away from you. He tests me to injure you. And I'm not going to do that. So I want you to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from this evil one. Amen? Do you know God can deliver you from the devil? Do you know God can deliver you from the devil? 
Too many of us are worried about our loved ones who get on drugs and who get in trouble and who got problems that you can't solve. Stop worrying about it. Whatever they got, whatever their problem is, God can solve it. There's nothing too hard for God. You got to learn how to turn your plate down and to go into spiritual warfare. I told the baby the other day, they came in to talk to me. I said, baby, you know what time it is? It's time for you to put on the whole arm of God and stand, amen, and go into spiritual warfare. Do you know how to go into spiritual warfare? Stop eating. You eat too much anyhow. Stop eating and start praying and go in the spiritual world. Tell the devil you are a liar. You can't have my child. You can't have my wife. You can't have my husband. You can't have my loved one. You got to go in the spiritual warfare. Amen. Because the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. It's always been the Lord's. And all you got to do is turn it over to the Lord and God will fight your battle. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that love. We are more than conquerors through him that love us. We are more than conquerors through him that love us. Been watching this special presentation from the Abyssinia Missionary Baptist Church. We pray that this message has been a blessing to you. If you're not a member and you want to give your life to Christ, email us at info at abyssinia.org or call us at 904 696 1770 or respond to our Facebook page at Abyssinia Missionary Baptist Church Jax. If you want to make a contribution to the ministry by way of tithes and offerings, go to our website at abyssinia.org and click online giving. Select your type of contribution and it will take you to a secure page to make your transaction. If you want to send in or drop off your contribution, you can do so at 10325 Interstate Center Drive, Jacksonville, Florida, 32218. You can also cash out your contribution to dollar sign the AB 101. Thank you again for watching and God bless.